we view suicide prevention as a, a vital but a just initial step in helping someone recover. You know, I think if we stop at suicide prevention, we fall short of our goal of helping people you know, really live. That was Dr. Sean Barnes on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are four clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting-edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, and co-author of Act Daily Journal. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, co-author with Debbie on Act Daily Journal and practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. From coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. And from sunny San Diego, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty and the Big Book of Act Metaphors. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. We're so happy to be partnered with Praxis Continuing Education here at Psychology Off the Clock. They offer continuing education for promoting lasting change with evidence-based training, and they're the premier provider in continuing education for clinical professionals. Some of their ongoing, on-demand, anytime classes include ACT Immersion with Steve Hayes, ACT in Practice, and also the DNA V model, which is with Louise Hayes, who works with adolescents and is fantastic. Yes, and we have big news. We, Diana and Debbie here, are offering a Praxis training. It's a two-hour workshop on Wednesday, April 28th, and you can sign up. Best of all, it's free and anyone can join. It's not limited to therapists. And what we're going to do is talk about some of the concepts from our book that we have coming out in May and offer you some practices that you can use from acceptance and commitment therapy to thrive in your own life. So we're really excited to be offering that. You should check it out and we hope you can join us. So go to our website, offtheclockpsych.com, to get a promotion code on live events through Praxis. Hi, this is Debbie. I'm here today to bring you an episode on suicide with my colleague, Sean Barnes. And to me, as a therapist, I think suicide is something that is really important to be aware of and to be thinking about and talking to clients about. And I know that it's a hard topic and that this it's a topic that sometimes is hard to talk about, hard to listen to. And part of my mission behind wanting to bring this episode to you all is that I really think it's important that we have a conversation, that we become more open to talking about this subject, because I think it's necessary to, to reduce some of the stigma that's associated with talking about suicide. I know it can be really scary and hard, but I think the more that there is stigma attached to it, um, the harder it is for people who need help and who need support, it, it's harder for them to reach out and get it. Yeah. And Yael's here with me today. I know, Yael, you had some thoughts as well. Yeah. I mean, just to dovetail on what you were saying, Debbie, it feels a little bit like the kind of mentality that we used to have around sex. Like if we don't talk about sex with teenagers, they just won't have it. And of course we know that that's not true, that those kind of urges exist and that we need to talk about it in order to give people the tools that they need. And when it comes to the stigma, I mean, I've actually had some personal experience with this where when I was in graduate school um, for to get my PhD in clinical psychology, somebody very close to me made a pretty significant suicide attempt. And what is so ironic is that surrounded by people in clinical psychology, I didn't feel comfortable reaching out for the support that I needed, both in terms of my own well-being, because it really shook me up, but also to be able to offer this person tools from people who had them. Um, And so I think that just really speaks to the fact that even within the field of clinical psychology, among people who have PhDs or are working towards PhDs, the stigma is so intense. And I think that really does just make it a lot harder for people to access the kind of tools that would be useful. And the other thing that I was going to say is that this person who made a significant attempt is doing wonderfully today. I mean, it's many years later, but I think it also just speaks to some of the um, stereotypes that we have about what a suicide attempt or suicidal thinking means for somebody's life course. That, and and the, the truth is, and the research bears this out, that if we intervene, if we give people tools that 
even if you're having significant suicidal thoughts, or even if you make an attempt, that recovery is possible and that a full and fulfilling and rewarding healthy life is is within reach if you access the tools. And the more that we talk about it and make those tools available to people, the better off we'll all be. I love that message. I think that's a, a nice note to start the conversation with as we move into the interview, because I think there's hope, there's things out there that can help people, but sometimes the hardest part is to acknowledge that you're struggling and to reach out for that support. I just wanted to start with a couple of quick notes. This episode is really geared a bit more toward clinicians, although of course anyone is welcome to listen to it, but I think it might be especially of interest to clinicians. Um, I also wanted to just say that there are a lot of resources available for anyone who would find them helpful, whether you're a clinician, a loved one or family member of someone who's struggling with suicidal thoughts or behaviors, or whether you yourself are experiencing that. And so we're going to provide some resources on the show notes for today's episode that you might find helpful. So check that out. And I also wanted to just provide everyone with the National Crisis Hotline, which you can call anytime if it would be helpful if you're struggling. And that number is 1-800-273-8255. I also just wanted to let our clinicians who are listening know that Sean and I together, along with a few of our colleagues, Lauren Borges, Jeff Smith, Nazanin Bareini, we are presenting a virtual two-day workshop for therapists on using ACT for suicide prevention. It's part of this year's virtual ACBS World Conference. It's a pre-conference event, and it's happening on Saturday, June 12th and Sunday, June 13th. It's about four hours a day, and there is continuing education credit for that. We're going to be helping clinicians with some of the challenges in working with suicide. We're going to practice using this approach we're talking about today to help conceptualize suicide, take a look at how contextual behavioral practices can help us work more effectively with suicide. And we're going to demonstrate how to create an act consistent suicide safety plan to manage suicide risk. So if you like what you're here today, we hope you will join us and take a deeper dive. And you can register for that at contextualscience.org. We'll put a link to it in our show notes for today's episode. Sean Barnes is a clinical research psychologist at the Rocky Mountain Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center, or MIREC, for veteran suicide prevention and an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Colorado Denver School of Medicine. Sean is an ACT clinician and researcher. He is a national consultant with the VA's Suicide Risk Management Consultation Program, which provides free consultations, support, and resources for providers working with veterans at risk of suicide. Sean is also a VA ACT for Depression provider and training consultant. Sean's research is focused on suicide prevention and recovery. He's the principal investigator of the ACT for Life study. We'll be talking about that today a little bit which is testing a brief ACT protocol for maximizing recovery after suicidal crises. And other aspects of Sean's research focus on ACT for moral injury and suicide risk assessment. And all of his projects share a common goal of alleviating suffering and helping others build vital, meaningful lives. Sean, so happy you're here. Welcome. Uh, Thank you, Debbie. I'm so happy to be here as well. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to speak with you and your listeners and and talk about some of the work that we've been doing together. Well, we were just talking about how this is a topic near and dear to both of our hearts and how it just feels really important to be able to share some of this with the world. So, so grateful that you're here, Sean. Um, I think you wanted to take a moment to thank a few people and make make a quick... Disclaimer. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Uh, this is, you know, work that we've been doing for a number of years uh, with some wonderful collaborators. Um, you, you, of course, and then also uh, Lauren Borges, Jeff Smith, Nazanin Barini, and Robin Walser. Um, we've also had great support from uh, Lisa Brenner, the director of the Myrick and the, the VA in general. Um, 
I also wanted to just kind of officially state that I am here as a psychologist off the clock. I uh, do work for the VA and the University of Colorado, but I'm not here to speak on behalf of any organizations. And, you know, my statements really are my opinions alone and don't necessarily reflect the opinions of the VA or the U.S. government. I've had to make that disclaimer myself many times. And sometimes I'm like, thankfully, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, we do not represent the U.S. government. We are independent agents. Yes, exactly. Suicide prevention is always a really important topic. I think right at the moment, people are really concerned about suicide during the pandemic because of the mental health concerns that people have about what we've been going through. Sean and I happened to be recording this interview, too, the day after uh, Meghan Markle, you know, mm-hmm. from the royal family. She talked about suicide in an interview with Oprah Winfrey just yesterday. I didn't watch it. I know, Sean, did you watch that? I did. I caught most of it uh, in between uh, trying to get my kids to go to sleep. I'll try to watch it soon. Um, but I just noticed I checked social media and it was, there's a lot of conversations about this right now, just the stigma and kind of just opening up about it. And I think that's part of our mission today is that it's really important in our quest to help with human suffering, that suffering that we talk about this really hard subject and what's going on with suffering in this way. And as clinicians who are listening, I think it's really important that we think about how we can do our best to work effectively with suicide. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I really appreciate it when um, public figures open up about uh, suicidal ideation, because I think it is a place that our mind uh, goes as, as humans. And really, that's been acknowledged really from the beginning of, you know, kind of the first writings about acceptance and commitment therapy, that we have this, you know, powerful word machine that helps us plan, but also can can trap us. And, and in the process of trying to think our way out of things, kind of the most extreme um, place our mind goes is considering suicide. And it's uh, an issue that you know, has been stigmatized, but, um, and there have been unfortunate myths about, you know, talking about suicide, uh, fears that that would somehow make people more suicidal. And there couldn't be anything that's further from the truth. Uh, you know, I think we need to get people to open up about this issue, acknowledge that it's a, a not an, a terribly uncommon experience for people to have, and that there are many solutions and resources to help um, people find other options. Exactly. The more we can open up to talking about it, the less it becomes this shameful hidden thing. And so then yeah. people can get the help that they that they need. I think for as a therapist, you know, we do get used to talking about it, I think, more. And yet it can still feel really s- stressful when mm-hmm. we feel that there's risk of suicide. We're worried about our clients. Sean, can you tell us what are some of the challenges for therapists in terms of, you know, both managing suicide risk and working effectively with suicide. Why is this such a challenge for us? Um, I think, you know, one of the reasons it's such a challenge is because, you know, the people in this business really care. Uh, We go into this line of work because we want to help people. Right. And uh, don't want people to, to die by suicide. So a lot of times we're sort of automatically put in a position of um, being at odds with our clients when they start to talk about suicide, because um, for most of us, probably if we're honest with ourselves, that's something that we don't want people, an option we don't want people to choose. Um, And we might also have expectations that are unrealistic in terms of our ability to prevent people from choosing suicide if that's something that they are, are committed to. Um, as I say that, I want to be careful to not portray suicide as something that's inevitable. I think that there are, are many, many options um, to uh, avoid, you know, that that path and that choice. But as humans who have free will, uh, suicide is is on the table for people. And being in institutions that are also very motivated to prevent suicide. Um, there's a lot of pressure on clinicians uh, from an institutional or also legal um, perspective. And we can start to work from a place of fear that is not aligned with where the client is at. And and that can create a a lot of challenges. So I think, you know, one of the main ones is that, you know, we typically have this agenda to keep patients alive and, and um, 
the clinicians can have fear of, you know, maybe saying the wrong thing at a critical moment, doing harm, um, somehow violating ethics or, or being liable, you know, for malpractice. It, it, uh, suicide is, is one of, I think, consistently rated as one of the most sort of stressful issues to, to navigate as a clinician. I think also, you know, working with suicide can be very emotionally challenging. Uh, clients' deaths from suicide are, are reality that sometimes need to be faced. And um, the people who are considering suicide are, are often, um, you know, their mind is gone there because of the intense pain that they're in. So sitting with this real profound human suffering and not getting totally derailed by, you know, checklists or expectations in terms of um, needing to to do the right thing and make the right decision around hospitalization, particularly, you know, can, can kind of pull us out of our place where we would typically sit alongside a client. I think it's so true. I say this a lot that it's, it's a courageous act to kind of wade into this level of suffering with people. And sometimes it's out of fear that we have so much pressure to, to handle this quote, right. I'm doing air quotes because I think there's this feeling that, oh, we have to get this right to keep our client alive, to make sure that we do everything we're supposed to be doing. But that when we get into that place of being driven by fear, it can really interfere with our ability to do our best work. Absolutely. And I think it can also, you know, clients are certainly aware too, as we, we shift into a place um, that can be perceived as you know, therapists kind of covering themselves, right? Or needing to check the boxes. So it, it, it can almost be stigmatizing and prevent discussion of suicidal ideation or urges in that once I, you know, as a client, once I say that, then we're going to need to go down this road of, of boxes to check. And as I say that, I also, I, I think it's a somewhat controversial topic sometimes around the the value of suicide risk assessment, but I firmly believe that suicide risk assessment is is critical. Um, I think that steps that organizations have taken to implement universal screening and um, you know means safety discussions are really important. Um, and I also acknowledge that at the same time, um, when we're really focused on needing to comply with a protocol correctly, it it can take us out of the place where we're, you know, with the client. I think that's one thing I'm, I'm actually looking forward to discussing more in the workshop is kind of how do you meet the requirements of organizations in terms of suicide risk assessment, but also do a, an assessment that's going to help you join with your client to better understand the function of the behavior that suicidal ideation or, or uh, you know, actions are playing for them. I think that's right. This is my opinion is that it is important to do a full, complete risk assessment, but it's partly the how are you doing it? You know, are you doing it in this collaborative sort of open exploration way, or is it more like a box checking kind of thing? But then also, that's not all you're doing, right? You want to do that, but then you also need to address it clinically, because if all you're doing is the risk assessment and then that's it, you're missing an opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah, huge opportunity, really. I mean, I think suicide you know consideration of suicide often comes at a time when people are feeling pretty hopeless about life and maybe have tried a lot of other solutions and are feeling lost and um i think that can be a really poignant time to to do work to help them shift that hopelessness to uh more around the control agenda right so this that kind of you know standard act uh, idea that a lot of what we do is focused on avoiding our uncomfortable or unwanted internal experiences. And, um, you know, it can be a really important time for change for people to sort of shift a trajectory when they're in a place where they're, they're considering suicide. Um, but as you know, if we get too caught in our desire to kind of control their behavior, check the right boxes and, and our anxiety shows through, I think that also can have, unintended consequences as far as clients potentially uh, shutting down and, and being less willing to go there with you uh, to a place that's, I think, scary for both parties a lot of the time, you know, such a high, high consequence, um, you know, in terms of lost opportunity. I think for that reason, it's very important to know what kind of personal barriers tend to come up for you, you know, as a therapist, 
working with clients who are suicidal and and practicing some mindfulness of your own behavior and and your own you know thoughts and emotions that uh, might be uncomfortable and difficult to sit with uh, that can go a long way to giving you the ability to be flexible in the way that you are as a clinician um, and not have you know unintended negative consequences uh, come out of a place of you know concern and fear. Absolutely. I think it's important as a therapist to really be open to that and have your own awareness so they don't get in in the way of doing the best work you can. We are so excited that Act Daily Journal by Diana Hill and Debbie Sorensen is coming out on May 1st. It's available to pre-order now at barnesandnoble.com or you can link to it through drdianahill.com or through our podcast webpage. So, Sean, how is the ACT approach to conceptualizing suicide unique compared to traditional approaches? So often uh, suicide risk assessment focuses on more of a kind of structural assessment of uh, suicidal ideation and urges. So looking at things like, you know, frequency and duration and uh, planning and behavior, which are all very important, but I think can fall short in terms of con- understanding the function of suicidal behavior. And, you know, ACT being based in um, contextual behavioral science really does call upon the clinician to help clients uncover why why suicidal ideation and behavior is being maintained. So we can take a little bit more of an ideographic approach, I think, and, and kind of dig into the specific experiences that people have uh, to help them see, you know, why does suicide continue to come up for you? You know, why do you continue to think about this? And and what different points might we be able to intervene to help you meet meet your needs, but without using suicide or thinking about suicide as the solution to your problem? So in considering the, the function of suicidal behavior, um, ACT recognizes that, you know, or ACT clinicians should say, you know, recognize that there are like many different pathways or, you know, events or um, functions that can lead people to consider suicide. But there's this big convergence on kind of rigid and unworkable attempts to control unwanted, mostly internal experiences, right? So suicide's ultimately part of um, this larger control agenda that act can be used to undermine. And one of the things that I think is amazing is when you can uh, demonstrate that for a client, it can be a real aha moment for them to see the connection between a lot of the social learning that uh, we do, you know, as kids around, um, you know, needing to uh, get rid of or fix things that are bad or broken in the external world that we, we get pretty good at. And then, um, being delivered similar messages about our own emotions. You know, our society definitely teaches the message that we should be able to make ourselves happy all the time. And if we can't, then there's something wrong with us. And that's just, you know, not, not real life. Uh, you know, we are thankfully animals that experience a a wide range of emotions, a wide range of thoughts, and that gives us the power to be successful, but can also keep us trapped. And when people are working too hard to avoid uh, these unwanted experiences, their behavior tends to get more and more constricted, more and more rigid. Um, You know, so you can think of, I think a really good example is um, someone who starts using drugs as a way to avoid, right? So I can use heroin and pretty quickly escape um, unwanted thoughts and emotions and and it's pretty effective, you know, in the in the short term, certainly reinforcing. And then, you know, my life starts to revolve around that. Like the long term consequences of of heroin use, I would argue, are you know very negative. Um, and you know, life starts to become about a way of avoiding pain and suffering, a way of not getting dope sick, you know, a way of um, continuing to be be numb and and avoid contact with this painful reality. And in a lot of ways, suicide is, you know, another step in that direction. So when someone feels like they've, they've tried a lot of different ways to fix the way they're feeling that have been unsuccessful, the mind continues to play out this, this control agenda, like we need to get rid of it. And if nothing else is working, well, you know, maybe I'm the problem, maybe life is the problem and I should, should kill myself and it would stop. Um, So in a lot of the creative hopelessness work I do with clients, we will take a look at really all the things they've tried to um, get rid of unwanted um, 
internal experiences, you know, and wandered emotions and thoughts and, and kind of how, how that's worked for them, you know, how successful it's been and what the costs of that have been. Um, I think it's, it's a really nice um, assessment method. I know it's one that um, Kirk Strossel and Patty Robinson talk about in, in uh, focused acceptance and commitment therapy and can be a nice way to highlight that, you know, suicide is just another part of this larger, larger series of things that you've tried that have, you know, maybe had some short-term efficacy, but don't last in the long run and typically come at a really high cost, you know, to the point where now your life is feels so small and so constricted and so painful that, you know, there isn't as much worth saving as there might have once been, you know. Uh, so I, I think suicide or acceptance and commitment therapy rather is a, a wonderful way to um, better understand the the function of um, suicidal behavior within this context of this larger control agenda. Um, sometimes that can oversimplify things a little bit because I do think you know suicidal behavior has a lot of functions both internally and externally typically, and um, that's why you know in ACT we use functional analysis as clinicians to better understand behavior on a regular basis, and uh, a lot of times we'll incorporate. Uh, chain analysis, um, which is a little bit more of a, a structured approach to a functional analysis that gets used a lot out of DBT. It's kind of grown out of that related contextual behavioral therapy. Uh, so my colleague Lauren Borges has done um, a lot of great work, I think, considering how um, to use chain analysis within the context of ACT. And that's something, you know, we would definitely be talking more about at the workshop. Um Oh, first of all, Lauren Borges has been on the podcast before. She talked about moral injury. So shout out to, she's also part of that pre-conference workshop we're doing. Um, I just wanted to say, I learned to do chain analysis when I was training in DBT years ago. And it's so helpful, I think, as a clinician and just often just really breaking it down. Like, what was the situation? Okay. And then what happened? And then what happened? And what were you thinking? And what were you feeling? And you know, these moments when people make decisions and they may be engaged in certain behaviors related to suicide, it's really important to understand what's going on there and also to help them kind of see places where, okay, maybe I could have done this, maybe I could have done that, you know, what are the consequences? And I mean, to your point about function, there's usually something reinforcing about it, especially if it's a behavior that's maintained over time. You know, people wouldn't keep doing it if it wasn't, if there wasn't something going on on the functional level to keep it going. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think um, suicide uh, is considered because we're looking for some sort of a, a solution to a problem and, and often meets immediate needs, even, you know, just thinking about suicide. It's been interesting working more with chain analysis and, and teaching it to providers. It's something that comes up a lot during that consultation service. And, and uh, Lauren and I have had the opportunity to, to do some seminars on it and uh, also a podcast uh, on it, which we can link to. I was able to interview her about chain analysis. And it, I think for a lot of clinicians who came from kind of behavioral programs or real behavioral training, chain analysis is sort of a, a bread and butter thing that that people know how to do. Uh, and then for other clinicians, I think like myself, who were trained in more of a, a kind of cognitive behavioral uh, program, there's uh, they've had less exposure to it. I think you described it really well, Debbie, in kind of the way that you help clients slow down and look at the sort of series of thoughts, emotions, um, physical sensations, urges, you know, behaviors that occurred leading up to a particular behavior you want to understand. In this case, often, you know, thinking about suicide, planning suicide or actual suicidal behavior, and then looking at the consequences of those behaviors. So, you know, how did I feel immediately after I came up with a plan for suicide relative to how I felt immediately before? Right. And often that can speak to the, the reinforcing uh, nature of the suicidal ideation. Then also asking how how did my environment respond right afterward? Right. So what happened um, when I when my family found out that I was considering suicide? You know, was there more support that was given to me? So it's a really nice way to help people look at suicidal behavior um, and uh, including internal behavior, you know, suicidal ideation 
and and consider why they do it. I think when you just kind of blanket say like, why were you considering suicide? You miss out on a lot of the richness that can come from the details of a gene analysis. And it's also a really like non-stigmatizing way to help people recognize the role that their environment can sometimes play in reinforcing the behavior. You know, often um, we'll ask people, you know, was your suicide motivated by like escaping the pain you're in or trying to influence other people? Um, and I think that was a, it's a standard question. One of the interviews that we used to do and almost everybody said, you know, well, no, it was just about, you know, the pain I was in. Uh, but then if you take a closer look, um, even if they're not intending to influence their environment or other people, their environment and other people still respond. Uh, so it can highlight, it can highlight useful ways to help, you know, families and loved ones provide support that isn't contingent or dependent on this uh, suicidal, you know, behavior or threats. You know, I think that's so important. It's, it's a little counterintuitive to think to think of something like a suicide related thought or behavior having any kind of function that could be reinforcing because I mean, I think our immediate instinct is like, oh, that's not good. Why would you why would you do that? But if you take a look at it, I think as a clinician, really understanding the functional level can also help inform it can help inform the clinical steps that you're going to take. Because if you don't really understand the function, you won't really know what's needed to be able to work effectively with the client. For instance, you know, if, if suicide is really like, I'm suffering so much, I can't think of any other way to resolve this problem. That's one thing. If it's more, you know, if it is getting sort of socially reinforced, that's another. I've also had clients before who, they have these thoughts of about suicide and they're very disturbed by them because mm -hmm. they've become this big, powerful thing. But in fact, it's just more like a random thought, but then the yeah. thought itself becomes distressing. And I think mm -hmm. that's a very different thing. In that case, what you want to do is actually sort of disempower the thought and just be like, you know, it's just a thought. It's not really mm -hmm. something you have to get too distressed about it. Just let it come and go through your mind. And you could think how in all of those different situations, the way that you as the clinician are going to approach the work is going to be very different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Chain analysis does a great job of uh, highlighting key cognitions and, and emotions to then target, you know, through um, act processes, you know, by engaging uh, diffusion, um, acceptance, or more generally, you know, mindfulness work. So I, I think that it's a, a really useful tool um, in, in the, we probably don't, don't have time to go into a lot of detail today about like what chain analysis is, but we can link to some other resources that, that have more information. And, um, you know, just to say that I think, uh, although functional analysis is, is built into act, um, chain analysis isn't something that is always used. And I think it can help us move past an understanding of suicide as only um, experiential avoidance. I think it largely is uh, often, you know, related to experiential avoidance, but it's important to also capture uh, the way the person's environment is responding and, and um, other ways that the behaviors could be being reinforced. So it's kind of more of a fine, a fine, fine grained way to assess the function of suicidal behavior. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus, when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T H R I V E market.com slash P O T C thrive market.com slash P O T C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love whole life pet. 
Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl meal mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. I think we should move into talking a little bit more about the actual, you know, intervention piece of using this ACT approach. And before we talk about that, I want to just say to me, you know, what you were saying earlier about just how there's something functional underneath this. Usually it's about trying to control something and people have tried so many things. And I want to just say as a clinician, when I talk to my clients about this, I think they find it really validating because usually it's not the case that they are they really want to die. In fact, the opposite. It's more that they don't know what else to do. This, to me, feels very destigmatizing and validating. And then from there, it sort of opens them up to other possibilities. Because usually people are just really stuck. They're doing the best. We're all doing the best we can, but they're stuck. And I think that there's so much hope in just acknowledging that and that and then together saying, okay, let's try a new approach. Let's try something different here and see what happens. Because I think that, you know, people are reaching out for help because they just don't know what else to do. Yeah, exactly. I think suicide comes when you really don't know what else to do. And and there can be this kind of a tunnel vision that develops around uh, suicide is the only option. It can be really difficult to see alternatives. And and life very much can be about that escape from the unwanted you know, experiences. And ACT does a great job of both helping people kind of normalizing that, you know, like, of, of course, your mind goes to this place, right? Your mind is this problem solving machine. And look, it's tried all these other things. And that hasn't worked. So we're going to go here. But like, what if there was another way, right? What if we didn't need to get rid of that thought? What if you didn't need to get rid of that pain? Um, and, and really helping someone make a turn toward, toward willingness and calling out this, um, Jeff Smith often will say in, in his groups, which I, I love this, he'll often say that you've been, you know, sold this uh, kind of false bill of goods, you know, you've, you've bought what society has taught you and you're on an impossible mission you know, to be able to just get rid of these things. Um, so there's this shift from I'm failing at this to wait, this is like an unreasonable, unworkable thing to be trying to do, to not feel sad, to not, to not experience um, pain. And instead, you know, helping people see uh, opportunity in life, at, if they can be willing to experience some of that discomfort and then move in a direction that actually has meaning to them. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about the specifics of that in a minute. But I think that's one of the most really rewarding um, moments for me as a clinician that I've had is when clients have, you know, people who have had chronic suicidal ideation, you know, multiple suicide attempts often will have this aha moment of like, wait, like I can have that thought and still do, like do the things I want to do. And, and I think if you can help people get to that point in a way that isn't um, making light of it or, or presenting it as like easy, you know, it's not like, oh, you just need to let go of this unworkable agenda of control and your life is going to be great. Like, no, these people have like significant problems often. That's why they're in the place they are. But it's tremendously freeing to present an alternative for them, you know, a real shift in the way they've been working so hard on this problem of life. Yeah. Like it's not your fault. You know, it's the, mm -hmm. it's the bill of goods. I love that. Yeah. Well, let's talk a bit about your in, in intervention that you're working on. Cause you've been doing research on an intervention called act for life. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about what you're doing. All right. So we're doing act. I think one thing I want to say up front, right. Is that we don't have a, there isn't like a 
I'm not trying to sell a secret sauce or anything, you know. So yeah, it was a you know initially this protocol was developed uh, as a way to help inpatient clinicians provide some guidance and engage people in ACT to help them maximize their recovery after a suicidal crisis has led to hospitalization. Um, but the work that we've done is really expanded past that to kind of more generally considering how do you engage people in ACT to not only prevent suicide, but also, you know, build lives that people will find, um, you know, vital and meaningful and be motivated to to live. So that's kind of why we've called it Act for Life. Um, you know, we view suicide prevention as a, a vital, but uh, just initial step in helping someone recover. You know, I think if we stop at suicide prevention, we fall short of our goal of helping people you know, really live. And uh, this work, you know, initially, um, you know, was started by the, the group of collaborators that I mentioned before. So Jeff Smith, Nazi Barini, Robin Walser, and then and then Lauren Borges has had a, a tremendous impact on it as well. And we originally did a, a formative evaluation, which is just a fancy way of saying we asked a bunch of leading experts in the field of ACT um, kind of what they would do if they only had like three hours with the client who was considering suicide or maybe it just attempted suicide. And we proposed sort of an, an outline of some things that, you know, intentions that we would have, things we would try to accomplish, um, but then really looked to them for for feedback. If I remember, Debbie, I think that you were one of those, those experts, uh, a- along with a bunch of other, um, you know, leaders in the field. So I really uh, and grateful to the people who participated in that. And you're right. I did. Thank yeah, you, Sean. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, or, or, yeah, thank you. So there were a lot of people involved, I would say, in the, the creation of this protocol. Um, and it is one that we haven't disseminated widely because it was meant to be more of a research protocol initially. And we've been moving in that direction of, you know, trying to figure out how to do you, do you use a a manual to um, help people do this work. Uh, it, it, that's a little, I mean, Debbie, I guess, uh, you know, I think you've probably had people, or I know you've had people on the show, you know, have who have talked about um, process-based therapies, right? And, and really the beauty of ACT is that we can respond to what the client's doing in front of us and not be stuck in a, a kind of paint by numbers therapy. So there's this tension between wanting to find a way to, um, teach people about how to use ACT for suicide and not make it be uh, paint by numbers um, in a way that could have a negative effect. Um, so, so after we did that initial uh, formative evaluation and kind of came up with a, a manual, we um, were lucky enough to receive um, some support from VA Rehabilitation Research and development uh, to do an initial study of Act for Life to see whether people found it uh, useful, whether they found it to kind of meet their their needs and be um, what we call it, you know, acceptable, and whether it was feasible, whether we could actually, you know, engage people in the intervention during a brief hospital stay, um, kind of how well would people tolerate it? I think within the at community at the time, there were still questions about like, can you really do like creative hopelessness work with someone who is feeling really hopeless? Um, you know, and, and some concern that engaging in intensive therapy, you know, might be too much for someone who's recently had a suicidal crisis. So this initial study helped us answer some of those questions. So uh, after we did the formative evaluation, we had kind of a bare bones manual. And that's been, you know, developed over a number of years through some research that we were able to do uh, that was funded by uh, VA Rehabilitation Research and Development. Over the course of a couple of years, we did an acceptability and feasibility study where we were able to kind of tweak and continue developing the the manual. And um, it really is meant to be a, a process-based approach to using ACT and engaging act with people who are su- suicidal or have been considering suicide and isn't necessarily um, a manual in the traditional sense of here's session, you know, I'm on session three. So today I'm going to say these things, but we do have kind of three broad 
overlapping modules with specific intentions. And in the first the intention really is to join with the client to undermine the control agenda. So it's a, a lot of uh, kind of what I, you know, we were just talking about helping people understand the function of their suicidal behavior, kind of pulling back the, the, the curtain on the wizard of Oz, you know, of like, why, why do I keep doing this and normalizing it um, to some extent as a, you know, normalizing suicidal idea thoughts about suicidal ideation or even suicidal behaviors as um, a place that our minds will turn to when they get stuck. Um, so we do a lot of, you know, empathizing with the desire to end suffering by suicide and uh, quite a lot of, of creative hopelessness work on the, the front end to, to help people start to release um, their, their grip on being determined that they're going to, you know, avoid, these unwanted internal experiences and thoughts. Well, I find that creative hopelessness is important and it's, well, first of all, I want you to maybe say a little bit more about what it is. I also just, as someone, you know, a clinician myself, but also I've trained other clinicians in this approach. I think sometimes it feels a little, um, they might be reluctant to do this because it feels like trying to let go of something that's, like it feels a little scary. So tell, can you tell us a little bit more about that and and like why it might be helpful? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, creative hopelessness is about um, helping people feel hopeless about the control agenda, right? So helping people feel that the approach they've been taking to avoiding and getting rid of you know, unwanted internal experiences. So thoughts, emotions, physical sensations, that that's going to ever work. You know, so it's about helping them recognize that this pain is part of life. And um, we want to help them get to a point where they're ready to pivot toward uh, willingness, you know, and and, um, being more accepting of, of, of that pain and still moving in a direction that they care about. But it's really, you know, and I think I can say as an early like at clinician initially as I was working with some of this stuff, it was kind of scary to sit with someone who feels so hopeless about life, right. That they've tried to take their own life, that they've attempted suicide. And then to sit there and ask them, well, tell me about the things you've tried and how miserably you've failed. Right. I mean, essentially is, is um, that's an extreme way to say it, but you're asking about the workability of the different things that they've tried, knowing that it has brought them to this point. So, Clinicians, I think, can be afraid to do creative hopelessness work with people who feel hopeless about life. But I think the really important message is that creative hopelessness isn't about making them feel hopeless about life, right? It's about making them feel hopeless about this control agenda and instead turning toward an alternative. And that turn toward the alternative is really important, too. Right. And I I think maybe that's one place that I might differ a little bit in the work that I would do is is I would want to turn, you know, make that turn like by the end of a session, as opposed to letting someone sit as an outpatient for a long time with this, you know, um, uh, un- unknowing of, of what the alternative is. So, you know, we present, we talk about, um, you know, like what, what if you didn't need to make your life about getting rid of that pain? What if your life didn't have to be about not thinking about suicide, about not feeling distress. Um, what if we could have that and do things that are, are meaningful and, and also addressing that, like, you know, we're not saying this is a, you know, you just need to have it and, and, you know, agree to do this and everything's going to be fine, but we're going to teach you ways to change your relationship to that pain in a way that will free you up to still live your life. So we're creating hope for them about life, uh, but hopelessness about the control agenda. And I'm here to tell you, as someone who's done this work for a while, that for clinicians, it does sound scary, but almost every client I've done this with or case I've consulted or supervised on is that clients really resonate with this. And it's almost like this phoenix rises from the ashes, ready to start something new and different because they've been so stuck for so long that it feels kind of liberating. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, we do it in a way that is very empathic and supportive and collaborative, right? We're not 
trying to belittle their experience or offer like in a glib way, you know, kind of like, oh, I have this solution. It's, you know, we're just going to do this and then life is going to be, you know, better for you. Um, you know, it, it, and I think part of that early work in, in Act for Life that we're doing is helping to join with the client and and um, normalizing that their mind would go there because they've been taught this strategy, right, over time. So like, of course, your mind would go there. But let's let's look at what the cost of all of these things have been and what has made your life. But like, what if you didn't need to keep heading in that direction? Um, so I'll, I'll also, you know, help people highlight the the cost of suicide, you know, in terms of lost opportunity. And I think even some of the people who have been you know, kind of the most committed to death by suicide that I've worked with, you know, have been able to, um, they could still express a good amount of disbelief that they're going to like turn their life around, but can see that, you know, death is guaranteed. Like that's, cause we'll, I'll use that like kind of dark humor sometimes too, that, you know, like it, you're going to die at some point. Like that's a given. Right. But like, what if you have the opportunity to live? Cause you do, you're like, you're sitting here with me. How can you use that opportunity um, to, to maybe do something that will be of value to you? That'll be important to you. And that, that motivational component, I think is really important to suicide prevention work. I think I've done a lot of work with, safety planning in general. So for folks who aren't familiar with safety planning, it's like making a, a hierarchical list of ways that you can cope if you're in a suicidal crisis. So kind of based on this idea that we have trouble thinking clearly when we're in this um, kind of suicidal frame of mind, you know, things can get narrowed and it's tough to think about um, ways to to move past it. But suicidal crises typically last like 10 to 30 minutes, like the, the worst of them. So if we can get people through that point, it can go a long way to preventing suicide. Um, so we'll work on the inpatient unit to, to help people fill out these plans of how they're going to cope if they are in a suicidal crisis. And I would regularly be, you know, ask people like, have you filled out your safety plan? It's, yeah, I've done lots of safety plans, right? But I haven't, I haven't used them. I haven't like looked at them after I was discharged. So I think a lot of that is because we need to understand the larger context of their lives and, and help them have hope for a, a different and meaningful future um, that will make it worthwhile to to get that safety plan out and take the risk of, you know, calling others for help or, um, you know, uh, kind of white knuckling it through some really difficult times. It's like giving people a why, you know, behind why yeah. to do that. Why? Why it's exactly. Doing. And for folks who are listening, we will link to some safety planning tools and materials on our show notes for today. And we'll be delving into co-creating with your client an ACT consistent safety plan in our workshop in June. So please join us if you want to learn more about an ACT, ACT consistent approach to safety planning. So, so we talked a little bit already about the first module, kind of, you know, more of joining with the client, helping them understand um, where suicide fits within this larger control agenda and trying to to free them up from that control agenda to turn toward um, willingness and uh, acceptance of some uh, pain while also moving toward their values, you know, putting their values into action. So the second module really focuses on um, helping to to engage those sort of left-sided hexaflex processes for the clinicians out there. Um, so things kind of more focused on, on mindfulness and acceptance. And it really, um, the intention is to, to teach skills to change the person's relationship with the pain underlying their desire for death, right? So we're not just telling them like, oh, you need to be okay having these <laughs> thoughts and emotions, right? Um, we're, we're teaching them mindfulness, um, cognitive diffusion strategies, and um, helping them be able to experience some of those things and, and still um, move on with their lives. So uh, I won't go into detail about that. I think, you know, we use a, a lot of kind of standard act experiential exercises, um, but really focus in on the key um, emotions and cognitions that, and behaviors that have uh, been highlighted through that initial 
work with the client and understanding the function of their suicidal behavior. Um, For any listeners who want to learn more about ACT who are less familiar, check out our podcasts because we've done a ton of episodes on various ACT topics. So you have plenty of materials to work with. Excellent. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, there are some some really awesome uh, episodes on here, Debbie, that I think for someone who's trying to get more familiar with ACT and, and get a, a sense of, you know, what it's all about. Um, in, in that second module, we'll also um, help them start to integrate some of the things we've been doing into their safety plan. Um, we can talk more or we probably can't talk more today, I think, in the interest of time around what makes a safety plan app consistent. Uh, I think we'll you know, be able to go into a lot more detail in the, the workshop we do. But often, uh, just really briefly, I guess, um, we focus a little bit less on on distraction and, and kind of, you know, how do you make sense of uh, wanting to uh, teach someone to use distraction when we're supposed to be about acceptance and, and showing up to emotion. Uh, so we focus a lot on workability and kind of, you know, what is that distraction in the service of? We also help them um, identify things that would really be like uh, meaningful, positive behaviors that they can engage in while dealing with the, the crisis to kind of um, hopefully increase the chances that they'll, they'll use that safety plan and do a lot with um, values and reasons for living as well. The way I look at it when I do safety planning is about teaching them some flexible ways to respond, to build some new behaviors and, you know, expand their behavioral repertoire. Because I think often people get in these patterns and the safety plan can help people think of other ideas of things to do when they're going through hard times. So it's really about more flexibility. Definitely. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I think being able to consider other options when we're in a state of crisis can be so difficult. So we do a lot of work to help people start practicing um, things on their safety plan right away, you know, to kind of overlearn it. So it'll be more instinctual uh, when the time comes. And then the, that third module that I mentioned, really the intention there is like building life. So it's a little bit more about the right side of the text of flex processes and, um, engaging uh, values and committed action work to make behavior change, right? And expand that um, behavioral repertoire. Uh, often, we're at least on the, the inpatient unit, when we when we see folks, their lives have been um, pretty uh, constricted as a result of a lot of the um, ex- behaviors they've been doing in the service of experiential avoidance, right? That they've lost a lot of the meaning in their lives. So the, the, well, really critical part of the work um, is helping people start to identify and frequently engage in value consistent behaviors to, to build more meaning into their life and help them identify more reasons for living. Um, and we do this right away uh, with people, right? So it's not something like, oh, when you get discharged, you're going to need to figure out how to do this. Or, um, you know, as a, if I was working with someone as an outpatient, you know, that like, oh, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, you know, finding meaning part uh, towards the end once you've learned a bunch of skills, you know, instead it's like, what can you do, you know, after the first session to, um, that would, that would bring, that would be important to you, you know, that would, that would, um, bring one of your values into action. And then a lot of times too, in the the third module, we will help people with skill development, you know, so if they have, um, you know, deficits in, in problem solving or, or kind of setting uh, realistic goals will work with them um, to uh, build more workable ways of dealing with the problems that um, are driving some of their suicidal behavior. It's, uh, was it Linehan from DBT who first said, build a life worth living, right? Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, the work that we do is totally in service of that that goal of building a life worth living. Um, and a lot of the times, you know, people who are in a lot of distress and suicidal um, have difficulty identifying what what a life worth living would look like for them because it seems so unattainable. Um, so we'll help them kind of see the connection between their pain and their values. Um, you know, I think Steve Hayes, right. Um, and others have said that we, we hurt where we care. Like we only care. We wouldn't, we wouldn't get upset about things unless we cared about them. So helping people see, you know, what about the pain they're in actually points toward uh, a meaningful life for them. 
um, and, and in a way that's uh, achievable. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, it's about shifting, um, shifting their goals. Um, you know, people can get stuck on their minds can get stuck on those, you know, lost relationships, uh, decisions that are regretted, you know, missed opportunities, um, you know, morally injurious events and focus so hard on trying to, um, uh, fix that things that happened in the past in a way that isn't achievable, you know, how can we recognize the values that are in the fact that you care about that? And then how can we put those values into action? I really want people to have a, a vision of, you know, what a life um, could look like for them. And, and also acknowledging that there are going to be bumps in the road. Uh, you know, it's not a, um, thankfully it's not a one and done kind of, kind of thing. It's a, you know, life is something you get to continue working on. And every day you have the opportunity to do something that's important. Well, this is great, Sean. I really appreciate the work that you're doing and, and that you're bringing to the people who are suffering and also to, to do this effective work. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Did you want to follow up with anything about? I think one, I think the only other thing I'd like to get in is just a quick, um, reference to like the the article if people want to know more about the oh, yes. study and oh, then yeah, the yeah, yeah. grant um for the efficacy trial. Oh great. Um okay. Um do you want to say so something it, about that? Yeah, so I mean if people are interested in learning more about uh how are you know using act to um work with people who are at risk for suicide um it, there is a, a paper that's in press right now and available uh, through the Journal of Contextual Behavioral Science that we published on the pilot trial or acceptability and feasibility trial that we did of ACT for Life on the inpatient unit. So that that has some good information in it. And, um, you know, thankfully, the, the result of that study was that, that veterans found the intervention, they perceived it to be beneficial. It wasn't, you know, the study wasn't designed to see if ACT was going to prevent suicide or, or um improve functioning because the samples were, you know, still pretty small and we were still developing the protocol. Um, but it really supported moving forward to a larger trial. So um, recently we had a, an application for a multi-site um, efficacy trial to, to look at whether ACT, you know, can be used to prevent suicide and increase functioning. Um, we recently had an application selected for funding um, with VA Rehabilitation Research and Development. So starting later this year, we should um, be doing a, a four-year study um, that's going to be, be looking at uh, Act for Life as one intervention to help um, improve functioning and, and prevent suicidal behavior. So I'm really uh, grateful for what, you know, I think it's going to be that opportunity and uh, to get to continue this work with you, Debbie. Well, likewise, Sean, I so appreciate the work that you're doing in this area. It's really important. And we will link to that article on our show notes, as well as some other resources for both clinical tools for working with suicide, but also some more general, you know, suicide resource resources on our show notes for today. And as a reminder, please join us along with our colleagues in June for our workshop where we're going to delve more into this and learn more about using ACT for Suicide. Sean, Thank you so much. It was really great to have you here today. Uh, thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate the opportunity and um, just love this work and and the you know our our collaborators in it. Uh, I really hope that anybody who's out there listening today who needs support um, because of suicidal ideation or behavior will will reach out because there are um, a lot of opportunities to to find a way forward that doesn't involve suicide. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, and you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, and our interns, Katie Rothfelder and Melissa Miller. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our webpage, offtheclockpsych.com.